I define partial sums. We're going to look at an example problem that uses partial sums now. So we did some geometric sums, and we're going to do a non-geometric sum now. only infinite sum we know how to find so far is geometric series. How do I know this is not a geometric series? What would it look like if it were a geometric series? It would look like r to the n is equal to 0 or 1 going to infinity. So this does not look at all like a geometric series. Of course you need your r to be absolute value less than 1. So this is not a geometric series, so that's out. So we can't just use that formula. So let's write out some terms and see if we see a pattern. That's about the only thing you can really do on the non-geometric sums. Yep. Just right now, the first few terms. We've done this before. This may help us get a little insight. So that doesn't really look too helpful. If I asked you to integrate something that looked like this, what would be one way to do it? What algebra could you do? I could multiply them together, but what, what can I do to this fraction that you've done before? I could multiply by conjugate. That'll probably make it worse. How about partial fractions? So split it into the sum of two separate fractions. So go ahead and do partial fractions on this. This should be really easy. I think it breaks up very, very nicely. Oop, B is negative 1, not positive 1. Negative B equals 1, so negative 1 equals B. All right, any partial fractions questions? All right, now write out the first four terms of this sequence in the second version here.
what pattern do you see or what happens as we write out more terms? Denominator is definitely increased by one. What do I get if I add two of these adjacent terms together? Zero. So they're basically canceling out a bunch of these pairs of terms. So those two thirds will cancel, the fourths cancel. So what I wrote here is the first four terms. So this would be the S4, the partial sum of the first four terms. So I can write Sn is one over one minus one over n plus one. So that's the partial sum of the first n terms. And you can very easily take a limit of Sn. It should be really obvious what this will uh, what the limit of this will be when n gets really big. So the sum is equal to lim n approaches infinity of Sn. So just keep going to infinity. So our next theorem, if, I've probably said this before, but we're going to write it down officially. If summation a k, k equals 0 to infinity, converges, then limit of a k needs to equal 0. The reason is your terms have to get smaller if you're going to add them up and get a finite number. So if that sum converges, meaning it adds to a finite number, that means the terms have to get very small. So logically, theorems are written if A, then B. The contrapositive. is not B implies not A. So if you don't get the conclusion, then you could not have had the hypothesis. So what's the contrapositive of this theorem? If lim k approaches infinity, a k is not zero, then summation a k diverges. So it's the opposite of the conclusion. So if the limit is not zero, then the opposite of the hypothesis is it does not converge, which means diverge. This is called the nth term test for divergence. Just says if your terms don't get small, your sequence has to diverge. So these example problems, you're going to prove divergence. All right, so prove divergence of these two and use the nth term test for divergence. So all you have to do is take the limit as n approaches or k approaches infinity and tell me why it's not one or why it's not zero. And then you say by the nth term test diverges.
So our first limit did not exist, so it doesn't equal zero. And our first, uh, second limit was one, which also not zero. So did you substitute the I didn't sub No, the first, the first problem is indexed by n, and the second one's indexed by k. Yeah, that's what I meant. Like you just change that. So um, you happen to have three on top of this, uh, both of this uh, sum signals. So that you substitute like the k, you say k equals to um, infinity instead of k equals one, like you originally had. Did you over substitute that for it? So whatever the original indexing variable is, it's going to appear right there. So like this problem was k, the previous one was n. Yeah, I, I understand the, the letters. I just the number that goes after that, like limits. I don't know, oh yeah, it's it's the value at the top of the of the limit. It's that. Okay. So you just always just, okay. If if I did not do an infinite series, let's say I went to maybe a thousand instead of infinity, mm -hmm. those always finite sums always converge. Because all you have to do is add the numbers together a thousand times, and you have that that number. It's only when you hit infinity, have an infinite number of terms, you cannot just add them together. But this is if it equals zero. The limit equals zero. If the, if the limit equals zero, you have more work to do. Okay, so that that's basically saying it converges, but not at zero necessarily. So the terms can get small, but the series still may not converge. And we'll see examples of that. Okay. But you can say for sure if it does not get small, it has to diverge. So it diverges. But so, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, so if it does equal zero, that just means it might converge? It, might, it has a chance. Oh, okay. it, d it doesn't mean that it probably will, or it doesn't. It just says there's a chance. Oh, okay. There's a chance that converges, and it doesn't even say that it converges solely at zero. It, if it does converge, it can converge that other. Yeah, so this just tells you the terms have to get small. And if they don't get small, there's no chance of converging. All right, next up, we're going to look at some divergent. If you know some part is divergent, uh, what does that mean about other pieces? So if you already know that sum of AK diverges, then the following also diverge. So if you have a constant times AK, that'll also diverge. There is one exception. What value of C do you think that this could converge for? Zero. zero. So if you multiply these terms by zero, then this would converge, but of course this diverges when C is not zero. So this next one, sum of a divergent plus any other series is going to be divergent. Even when AK, uh, even when BK equals negative AK. So even if they would be the exact opposite in sign, it still would diverge. So we're going to have two more examples, and then we'll be out of 10, 2. So these are going to both be find sums. So numerator is 3 to the k minus 1. Denominator is 6 to the k. k equals 1 to infinity. So only ones we really know about is geometric. I'll write down the geometric sum again. So
So this sum that we're trying to find doesn't really look like a geometric series. What algebra can I do to this fraction to make it look more like geometric series? So let's split the fraction up in the numerator. So I didn't do anything fancy there. Just wrote it as two fractions subtracted. This looks a lot more like a geometric series. It actually looks a lot like two geometric series right here. So the second one is very close to being a geometric series. I'm just going to rewrite it as 1 6 to the k. So the second part's no problem. That's definitely a geometric series. The first part, we have to be a little bit careful. The powers are not the same right here. So these powers are not the same. How can I make the powers the same? How do, I, how do I turn 3 to the k minus 1 into 3 to the k? That actually would work. I'd add 1 to the power. Uh, we will be integrating and taking derivatives of power series in a little bit. But let's think about algebra moves, not calculus moves. That would work. What algebra? What do I multiply by to turn this into 3 to the k? Negative 1. Nope. What do I multiply this by to turn it into 3 to the k? Oh, 0? Nope. Almost. What, what do I get if I multiply by 3? All right, let's pretend like we know algebra. What do I do with the powers? Adam. 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 So what is k minus 1 plus 1? Zero. K. Uh, yeah. <laughs> k plus zero, sure. <laughs> All right, so you agree that if I multiply by 3, I get 3 to the k. OK. Now it's illegal to just multiply by 3, so I'm also going to divide by 3. So I'm not changing any, everything around. So I multiply by 3 over 3, and then copy down my denominator. So this is 3 to the k divided by 6 to the k times 1 third. So I gave the 3 basically another base. But in order to do that, I have to also divide by 3. So that's where that 1 third comes from. And now 3 over 6 to the k, that's 1 half to the k. 1 third times 1 half to the k minus 1 6 to the k. And we'll bring that summation back in. OK, any questions on those algebra steps? I know this is a little bit tricky, but we needed to write them as geometric series. So now I'm going to split it up. That 1 third I can factor out. So I'm going to write this as 1 third times the summation. What is preventing me from using our formula at the top, the geometric series formula. Why is what I have at the bottom not quite the same as what's at the top? R is small in both cases, 1 half and 1 six, so the R is plenty small. What's keeping me away from using this? Uh, you don't have the one minus the R on the 
So, well, I'm looking for the left side. I got my radius is small. Here we go. We're starting at one instead of zero. So, how do we compensate for that? We can write it. So I can start at k equals zero to infinity, and then go k plus one, like that. So drop it by one and compensate by upping it by one. Minus summation, one six to the k plus one. And now finally, we're gonna factor out one half and one sixth. And now we can use the one over one minus r minus one six times one over one minus r. Now whatever that adds up to is our summation. Sure, no problem. So I noticed a lot of algebra really quickly. Hopefully I'll give you enough problems that you can practice algebra at your own pace.